Gus, I remember in the 1994 season, it started there were these whispers going around that there were a number of clubs that had met. Uh, that there were, and generally, though, the out of Sydney clubs, there was talk that it was Canberra, uh, Brisbane, the Knights, and a few other clubs had met. Just a bit, a little bit of discontent that was happening, and you know the possibility. I mean, it sounds outrageous of this, you know, forming a rebel league and breaking away, and it, it was. Was so unlikely, I mean, I'll say to you, Freya, can you imagine if you heard a whisper that, oh, mate, Collingwood and Carlton are getting together and they're yeah. thinking about breaking away from the AFL, you just go, oh, that's fanciful, it's never going to happen. Anyway, this sort of started to bubble along a little bit. Anyway, at the back of the ninety, the 1994 season, it, it was sort of getting, the noise was getting louder and louder and it was Kerry Packer that stepped forward. Kerry Packer come forward and said, look, this is what I'm hearing what's been going on. Basically, um, basically, if anyone tries to break their ARL agreement, I'll sue the pants off you and put everyone back in their box. But as it turned out, you know, there were a number of clubs that were still sort of working behind the scenes. And I remember the week, the week before it broke, it broke on April 1st, on April Fool's Day. And the week <laughs> leading up, people, there was talk going, hey, there's talk that this Rebel League's about to happen. And by the time it really broke on Saturday, on the Saturday morning, the Canberra Rainers had signed, the Bulldogs, a lot of the Bulldogs players had signed, and the Brisbane Broncos en masse had signed to go to this Rebel League. And everyone, we were completely in the dark. We went, we went down to the hotel. Now, the Newcastle Knights at that point were non-committal. They were a club then that didn't have a lot of punch. We were, really, we were just at the beginning of our really sort of a good era for us and so we didn't have a lot of punching power as far as our administration was concerned and that to an extent they were, le they were left out in the dark so we go down to the hotel and as players we're getting calls from player managers and Super League representative AR rep rep AOL representatives calling us, calling our hotel rooms, just going, come, come across here, mate. There were player managers ringing me and Andrew because we didn't have a we didn't have a manager at that point, saying we're across, we're staying at Parramatta, we're across the road at the McDonald's. Come across, sign with me, and I've got a I've got a super low contract waiting for you. It was it was just out of control. In the end, you decided to stick with the ARL. What was your thinking there? What was the, I guess, the pros and the cons for for both sides of this war? We were we where most clubs were guided. Um, our our um, our administration at that point were like, hey, we're going to leave it up to you guys. Now, what? Look deep down, I think they believe that once we met with the Super League representatives and they go and they with the money they were going to offer us, and as far as pay rise. Uh, we we're, were concerned. I think the club thought, okay, what they're going to do, the players will agree to go to the Super League, then the, then the administration will put their hands in there and go, well, what choice have we got? The players have made the decision, that's where we're going to go. Uh, but what had happened, the Super League sent a couple of representatives and we sat and negotiated, but, but no one signed anything. Everyone was like, wow. And, and it was Paul Harrigan said, mate, I think we just owe it to the ARL to listen to them. And so the ARL the next night sent Phil Gould now the first represent the Super League representatives were solicitors, lawyers that went, which had no impression. We were young guys; there was no had no impression on us. You know, all we saw were the dollar signs from them, where where Phil Gould really sat down, and there was a fair bit of fear as well. He was like, "Guys, there's no guarantee this this rebel competition is going to get off the ground." You know, we, I remember him saying that the thing that really had an effect on me was that. Some of us were right at the beginning of our career and really just starting to get some traction in first grade and starting to make a career of ourselves. And he said, you know what, if you sign with this Rebel League, guys, you know, I, I hate to say this, but who knows, Ricky Stewart and Laurie Daly might have played their last ever game of Rugby League. Oh. And we all went, whoa. Anyway, at that point, our, our, um, our CEO walked into the room and Gus saw him and went, hey, hey, you, you, come back here. You're the CEO of this club. What do you, what do you want? To, what which way do you want the players to go? And he went in a moment of panic. Said, "We're happy with whatever the players do." Now I think deep down they they wanted to go Super League. I think. Yeah. And Phil Gould said, "Right, oh, everyone, raise your hands if you want to stay with the ARL." I think me and Andrew were just about the only ones who didn't put our hands up because I was like, "No, no, no, I, I, I'm seriously under. I don't know which way to go." But everyone went, "Yep." Everyone went in, sort of signed, started signing with the ARL, and we went. Well, if the boys are doing it, let's do it because we're we. As I said, we're at the beginning of a great era. We're all best mates. I don't want the Knights to break up. I don't want to have to go play with someone else. I want to play for the Knights. So we signed the ARL.
Wow. So, Maddie, when, you, when you're involved and your brother and so forth, there's normally some sort of funny story that will come out of any mm. sort of situation, you know, whatever situation you find yourself in. Is there any sort of story that you remember from that era that you oh. go, wow, that, that was funny in, in a time that was obviously at the time was hugely stressful for everyone? There are a lot of funny stories. The one I'll, uh, one I'll tell is, is that where we met the Super League guys was upstairs at the club, right over the ground. There used to be bar up the upstairs at the club. And a little bit like our meeting place here at Triple M, in, in that one of the offices is transparent. You know, it's just glass. It's a glass office, so you can see straight through it. Well, the Super League representatives, once they gave us the cell, they said, we want to sit down with every player individually. Now, they said, what's really important, guys, here is confidentiality. I don't want you guys to go away and talk about what's, who's been offered what. Now, the first guy who went in, and we're all standing at the bar with a beer, and we're watching <laughs> our first guy go in, and he was, he was a young back rower who at that point was on 25 grand a year. He goes and sits down with the Super League representatives, and we're looking at his face, and he, can, he all of a sudden has this <laughs> massive grin on his face, right? Mm. And they've told him, now listen, this is what the offer is, but this is confidential. Don't tell the others. Well, he walks, they're watching him as he walks completely. He walks straight out of the office, <laughs> walks up to us and goes, Oh, they've just offered me 350 grand. Oh! <laughs> at which we all start smiling. They just, one of them literally fell off his chair. <laughs> <laughs>